Hey guys, what is up? John here from flyatmycalvin.com. We are at 500 feet, we just took off and we just lost our engine. What are we gonna do about that? All right, master, mixture mags, prop pressure pitch is all set. We are all good, gauges are in the green. Let's go. Full power, everything is looking good here. Tail's coming up. Airspeed starting to budge. We'll go ahead and there we are. Off the ground, climbing out. Everything's looking great. Hum happy, hunky dory. And I got some emergency landing sites already picked out. Got some fields, got some runway. Runway's passing behind me now. There's 200 feet. Getting some altitude here. Everything's looking great. Trying to track the extended center line of the runway because we have a little bit of wind up here. Some winds aloft going for sure. There's 400 feet. And here we are. Oh! Darn, there is, oh crap, that's 500 feet. And guess what happens at 500 feet? The engine quits. What do you do? You have to take a second and go, oh my gosh, my engine quit. You're going to go ahead and bank. You're going to go ahead and yank, not too hard because you will die. And maybe aviate, navigate, communicate. Last thing to do, communicate. Venice traffic, Red Fairhawk, making the 180 to land runway 31, Venice traffic. We are letting that nose come down. I'm not pulling back too much. I'm putting some speed on my nose here. Power's all the way back at idle. All I got is the energy left in the airplane. I want energy right now. I'm turning, I'm getting this thing established over the center line. And now I've got to land with a tailwind and a little bit of a crosswind here in this tailwind airplane. Put some flaps in, try to make it a little bit more normal. And here we go. Let's try not to bounce it too bad. Oh, there we are, one wheel's down and the other one. And not much rudder authority with that tailwind there. And we'll go ahead and apply some light brakes, get that tail pin. There we are, that is the impossible turn. Oh shoot, I guess it's not that impossible after all. All right, so the impossible turn, this thing's been debated for many, many years. The idea that you do not ever consider making a 180 degree turn back to the airport to land on the runway you departed from until you hit 1,000 feet because turning underneath that would be impossible and it likely leads to a stall or spin accident, an accelerated stall, followed by an incipient spin, followed by possibly even a developed spin if you have enough time before you hit the ground. Now that has happened to many guys, and that's why this video needs to be watched very carefully and closely for the details in here that can possibly make you safer rather than make you less safe if you were to go out and attempt this right now. So, a couple things to understand here. We are used to making turns in a pattern of 20 to 30 degrees of bank. That will really cost you a lot of altitude if your engine quits. What's the most efficient bank angle to turn at if you lose your engine? Well, I'm gonna go ahead and bug 2,000 feet here, right? So we're gonna bug 2,000 feet. I'm at 2,000, oh, well, I'm at 2,700 right now, and since I'm lazy, I'm gonna go ahead and bug 2,200. We're gonna see how much altitude we lose in 500 feet here. So I'm at 2,700 feet. We'll go ahead and get stabilized here at 115 miles per hour, right at 2,700. That way we're gonna test this with a couple different bank angles and see what happens to us each time. So there's 2,700, 115 miles per hour, power goes to idle, and I go ahead and I'm gonna make a 20 degree bank turn here and make a 180 degree turn. So I'll make a 180. 20 degree bank turn here and see how much altitude we lose here trying to pitch for about best glide almost there and there's my 180 i lost about oh almost 300 feet in that 180 degree turn so 180 degree turn lost 300 feet let's go ahead and try this again we'll go back up now all right so we're back to 2700 feet we're at about 115 miles per hour, heading 070. Let's go ahead and flip this thing around in a left turn to a heading of 250 and see what happens here for us. Power goes to idle. I roll into a turn here, going right to 60 degrees of bank this time. Pitch in again for best glide. And because I'm accomplishing this turn much, much faster, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to lose a lot less altitude. There we are, 180 degrees. And that time I lost 200 feet. So I had an extra 100 feet to play with now to go ahead and try to land this airplane an extra 100 feet of altitude means there's more energy in the airplane, means you can actually get the airplane further and out of the runway because I flew a much shorter distance. And although I increased drag on the airplane by making a tighter bank turn, that drag all added up over time actually helps me. So yes, there's more drag making a steeper bank turn, but the turn happens so much quicker, your engine's not running, you are coming down at so many feet per minute. Maybe I come down at 800 feet per minute in a 60 degree bank turn compared to, oh, say 500 feet per minute in a 20 or 30 degree bank turn. But over time, that turn happens so much quicker that you'll lose a lot less altitude. So that's one of the things we did there to go ahead and make that impossible turn and make it happen quickly for us. We made that turn at a steep bank angle 
not sacrificing as much time in the air, although we were sacrificing some drag and some energy, we got the airplane pointed the direction we wanted to go right away. The other important thing to talk about is I was always pointing the airplane in a place I could land it. I never ever turned my nose away from a landing zone from the time I rotated until the time I turned back. And yes, we did give ourselves that three or four seconds there of shock. Oh my gosh, the engine quit. What do I do? What do I do? And then we tried to do something about it. We turned back to the airport. Really, you should never be shocked. There shouldn't be that three or four or five second delay. You should immediately be pointing the nose in a place you can always land at. And that's why when you look at different advisory circulars and the AIM that talks about what altitude you should turn cross one at, well, there's a little bit of room for debate. And let's go ahead and get this thing on the ground where I'm not so distracted with a bunch of airplanes around me and other traffic, and we can talk about this a little bit more. Okay, now that we're back on the ground, a little bit easier to talk about this here than when we're still flying the airplane looking for traffic and trying to control the aircraft. Now, let's talk about why this worked in the first place, right? We kind of talked about it in the airplane briefly. We'll recap it. I took off. We lost the engine at 500 feet, simulated, pulled the power to idle. We went ahead and banked steep, brought the airplane around. By banking steep, all right, so banking at 60 degrees or so, I was able to bring the nose around in a shorter distance. I flew a shorter distance to get back to the runway. I didn't want to bank at 10 or 20 degrees and be flying away from the runway and then bring the nose back around and then I'll have a longer distance to fly back to it. I wanted to get the turnover very quickly. And although, yes, you give up some vertical lift, all right, we're dumping that vertical lift to get horizontal lift to bring the airplane around, it is going to result in less altitude lost. Trying to turn the aircraft back to the runway at 10 degrees or 20 degrees of bank is going to cost a lot more altitude than doing it at a steeper angle of bank. Now, the obvious hazard associated there, as we increase our bank angle, the stall speed increases exponentially, all right? So as we increase bank and we start pulling back, we're riding right there at critical angle of attack. Very easy to get into an accelerated stall. Accelerated stalls low to the ground, wind up usually as spins and fatalities. Now I want you to pay specially close attention here to the angle of attack gauge as I execute this turn, all right? We know that our stall speed increases when we're in a steep bank, but really that's an increase because we're pulling back on the stick when we're banked, all right? Stall speed increases because of load factor, not because of the bank angle. You can bank to 90 degrees and not stall the airplane as long as you just don't pull back hard on the yoker stick. Load factor is what increases stall speed and you can easily increase your stall speed a whole lot and stall the aircraft even when you're in level flight or the wings are level by just pulling back too hard. So load factor increases the stall speed, not the bank angle. So why do we teach our students that at 500 feet, we should probably just point the nose straight ahead and above 500 feet, if the engine quits, well then we could possibly think about 30 degrees left or right of the nose on up to a thousand feet. And we would never ever consider a 180 degree turn back to the runway until we hit a thousand feet because the 180 degree turn from a thousand feet is actually the 180 followed by another 30 degree turn followed by another 30 degree turn. Or in my case, it was more like a 45 and another 45. So I made almost 270 degrees of turns to get the airplane back onto the runway. So why do we teach it the simple way? Just aim the airplane straight ahead. Well, we know that the student probably has a better chance of survival if they just fly it to the scene of the crash straight ahead and actually fly it all the way to the very end compared to stalling it and then falling 500 feet and dying. So here's my problem as a flight instructor. It's my job to make sure you're safe when you're going out solo, when you're signed off for a private pilot check ride with 40 or 50 or 80 hours in your book or whatever you have. Emergencies don't discriminate. Engines quit whenever they want to quit. Could be when you have 10,000 hours in your logbook, could be when you have 10, doesn't really matter, right? So it's my job to make sure you're ready for this in the best way possible. Here's my problem that I really encounter all too often in aviation. We see a lot of instructors and a lot of people in the aviation community out there say anything below a thousand feet is an impossible turn. It's too dangerous. They say it not because it's impossible. I just proved it's not impossible. It is very possible for the vast majority of general aviation aircraft that we operate. But they say it's impossible because other people said it was impossible. And the other people said it was impossible because they were trying to keep us safe because they knew that rather than trying to explain all the physics behind it to a private pilot, and they knew that the private pilot didn't really have the skill set anyways to pull it off, they just said, oh, it's impossible, don't try it, just go straight ahead. You'll be safer that way, right? Safer. Well, safer is not really you know landing in somebody's backyard crashing into their pool. That's not very safe. When there's a runway behind you, you could possibly land on. So what I've seen is these sort of myths perpetuated throughout the generations. And what it's led to is commercial pilots and CFIs out there telling their students, oh yeah, if the engine quits below a thousand feet, we go straight ahead and, and don't bank too much because we'll give up too much vertical lift and we'll, we'll fall and we'll crash. Don't do use a steep bank angle if the engine quits, it's too scary. 
And they really believe that. They believe, and they've said on check rides, I've listened to them, they've said, oh yeah, we'll lose less altitude with a 10 or 20 degree bank making 180 return with the engine out than we would with a 60 degree bank. They don't understand the fundamentals of flying the aircraft. And how can you be a safe pilot if you don't understand the fundamentals of flying the aircraft? And how am I doing my job as an instructor if I'm not giving you the information you need to understand the fundamentals of flying an airplane in all situations that you may encounter out there as a pilot? I get why there's a whole group of people out there that think talking about these things is taboo. That people will go out there and try this and they'll kill themselves and it's better to just not talk about it. But I disagree. I think it's important to talk about these things and for all of us to help each other understand and learn about this. Not saying to go do this, not saying that when next time your engine quits at 500 feet you should actually make the 180 return. I can tell you what I'm going to be doing. But it's up to you to have all the available information presented to you so then you can make an educated decision yourself. Ultimately, it's going to be you and your passengers and the people on the ground below you that have to live with your decision. So I get why people are trying to keep it safe and not talk about these things and just hush, shh, we don't talk about banking 60 degrees, you know, only 50 feet above the ground. That's too dangerous. I get it. But there's times where it works, where it could actually be safer than going straight ahead and landing in somebody's backyard, crashing through their house and killing them inside and probably yourself, all right? It's up to us as pilots to be responsible for the people on the ground, our passengers, ourselves, and our aircraft. We have to do what the safest thing is at any given time. And it's up to us as instructors and as members of the aviation community to share our knowledge and speak the truth and put all the truth out there and although YouTube, you have to understand, this is not the best platform for this, right? This is a very one-sided conversation going on here. You guys don't really get to ask many questions and I don't get to really explain anything further if there's some misunderstandings here. And misunderstandings here could easily turn into a very bad accident one day. So talk to your instructor about this, get a little bit more education on it. Most importantly from this video, if you take away nothing else, you can pull this off with the right skill, the right proficiency and the right confidence. And there's a good chance you lack either one of those three or possibly all three at this point if you're watching this video. So highly recommend you go out there, you find a good qualified CFI. I know it's hard to find CFIs, but guess what? If you're just willing to pay for good qualified instruction, you will find them. It does cost money. You're not gonna find it easily and you're not gonna find it for 50 bucks an hour. But if you want to learn how to actually control the airplane and keep yourself safe, which you should, well, guess what? It's gonna cost you a little bit, but highly recommend you seek that out. And as instructors, I highly recommend to all of you instructors out there, don't be signing somebody off in the bare minimum of 40 hours or the bare minimum of what you think they meet in the ACS. Make sure that they can control the aircraft in all regimes of flight. And if you don't feel comfortable with teaching this stuff, then you should probably go out and get some instruction yourself from someone who's familiar with aerobatics and pushing an airplane to its limits up high where it's nice and safe so you can pass that knowledge on to your students. It's our job as members of the aviation community, whether you're an instructor, a pilot, or just an aviation enthusiast, to make sure we're promoting safety and make sure we're promoting knowledge. And through knowledge and skill, we will have safety in general aviation. Side note about all this stuff. Advisory Circular 90-66 Bravo, okay? Great document, tells us how to operate at airports that are non-towered. Lots of really helpful information in there. Highly recommend you comply with that information when it ever is safe to do so. Also, the AIM, page 4-3-4, and I believe it's section 4-3-3, talks about operating in a traffic pattern. They say at a non-towered airport, well, you know, you should probably wait till about 300 feet before traffic pattern altitude to turn crosswind. So about 700 feet AGL for most airports. Okay, I'll buy that, that sounds safe. And no, oh, by the way, if you're departing the area and not staying in the traffic pattern, you should either should depart straight out or you should depart kind of straight out and then made a 45 degree turn left or right and then get away from the airport environment, away from the traffic pattern, and then proceed on course. Okay, that all sounds fine too. Here's where it doesn't work and where knowledge is really important and not just following the book and not just sticking to the book. We have to pass on actual real world knowledge to our students and tell them the truth, not just say, well, the FAA says this, so that's what we have to do. Take runway 23, for example, in Venice, Florida, okay? Take off runway 23 and you're underpowered Cessna 150 with a student on board in full fuel. You're not climbing so hot, are you? All right, there's no wind out there today. It's just a nice hot day. Well, you probably cross the beach at about 200, 300 feet and you probably are a mile offshore or better before you hit the 700 feet you need to turn crosswind according to the AIM or according to Advisor Circular 90-66. Well, guess what? 
I don't swim a mile in salt water after crashing an airplane because my engine quit. I'm not going to glide that mile back either at 500 feet probably, being able to make that 180 and glide back the full mile back to the beach. I don't turn crosswind at 700 feet when I'm a mile or two from shore. I don't think it's safe. In fact, the restaurant on the upwind of runway 23 at Venice, right on the beach there, is called Sharky's. It's literally shark infested water. I'm not swimming in that stuff. When I take off runway 23, regardless of my altitude, I turn crosswind when I hit the beach. I point the nose of my aircraft in a direction it's safe to land. When I handle a firearm, I always point the firearm in a direction that is safe. I never point it towards anything that could be hazardous or could cause harm. Same thing with my airplane. I never point my airplane in a direction that could cause harm to me. I always, when I take off runway 23, turn crosswind over the beach. That might be at 500 feet, that might be at 200 feet, neither of which complies with the aim or the advisory circular, but it's safe for me. It keeps my passenger safe, it keeps everyone else safe, and it doesn't leave me floating a mile offshore causing emergency services to go out where it's not safe to go get me, where I could just land on the beach safely and avoid anybody else on the ground. It's up to you to keep your passengers, yourself, and the people on the ground safe, and it's up to us to share that knowledge that hey, the book's got great recommendations, there's times where it's okay to deviate from that. If you take nothing away from this video, at least take away this. You need the skill, you need the proficiency, and you need the confidence to be able to pull off some pretty serious maneuvers when that day comes. Hopefully it doesn't come to you, and quite frankly, a lot of us instructors roll the dice that when we send somebody up solo with 10 hours in their book, that they're not faced with a really bad situation either, that we put them in a good, safe aircraft that will perform well for them, and they don't have to deal with this, an engine failure right on takeoff. But if your student is going to deal with an engine failure at takeoff at 500 feet with a bunch of houses in front of them, how is he going to handle that and what have you done as an instructor to prepare them for that? That's what I think about when I sign somebody off for solo. Hopefully you'll think about that as well. And as a student or as a pilot out there flying, think about where your skill is at, where your proficiency is at, where your confidence is at, and what we can do to help share knowledge with others and tell each other the truth about flying. It's not an impossible turn. It's an improbable turn. It's a dangerous turn. And it's a difficult turn. It's not impossible. That's the point of this video. Hopefully it helps. And as always, guys, if you cannot fly every day, fly at MikeAlpha.com. We will do everything we can to pass on our knowledge to you. And hopefully you can use that knowledge to be safe out there. We'll see you in the next one.